What do you think? Uh, what do you think? A father had two sons, and he was a farmer. And he asked his sons, went to the first son and said, "Son, I want you to do the chores that are required of you. This, this, and this." His son said, "Dad, I'm not doing it," and walked away. But later on, he had a change of heart. And he decided, I'm going to do what my dad asked me to do. And he did it. Well, the father went to his second son and said the same thing. Son, as being part of the family, you have these chores and I want you to do them. And his son said, sure, dad, I'll do that. No big deal. Count it done. And he went away and did nothing about it. Which of the two sons was obedient? Which of the two sons respected their father? Which of the two sons honored their father's request? You know, talk is pretty cheap, isn't it? Talk is pretty cheap. At the end of the day, it's two words, really. It's this, show me. Talk is cheap, show me. Here's the other thing that's cheap. Listening. Listening is cheap. Hearing is hollow. At the end of the day, it's two words. Show me. Knowledge is useless. Knowledge is useless. At the end of the day, you can know all there is to know. But at the end of the day, the question is, what did the knowledge change? What did it produce? What did it do in you? You know, as a father, and if you're a father, you know this. If you're a mother, you know this. Uh, If you've ever been in authority over someone, you know this. Um, Disobedience just drives you crazy. You know, when you ask your kid to do something and they just flat out don't do it, it's just like, ah, it seems so disrespectful. And there's just something that just, it drives a parent crazy, disobedience. But you know what is almost worse than straight up disobedience? hypocritical disobedience. When your child says, yeah, I'm all over that, dad. And then they go and do nothing about it. And there's just something in you as a father. It's like, okay, straight out disobedience is bad, but if you're hypocritically disobedient, that's just, ah, it's just worse. And you know, we have a heavenly father who just hates, hates, hates hypocrisy. Just as we do. Because here's what's true of you and I, whether you're a a church person or not a church person, whether you're a person of faith or you're not sure about Jesus, here's what's true of all of us. We all hate hypocrisy. It drives us crazy. We push against it. When we run into hypocrisy, there's just something in us that repels hypocrisy. It's interesting, as uh, people have studied why people are leaving the church or the reason why people wouldn't want to be part of the faith, the Christian faith or the church, one of the top three reasons people are leaving the church or don't want to be part of a church is because of hypocrisy. We hate hypocrisy. And if you're a Christian, you probably think, I hate hypocrisy. And if you're a non-Christian, you probably think, I hate hypocrisy. And here's what's true about you whether you're a person of faith or not, when you hate hypocrisy, you're a lot like Jesus. And you're a lot like your heavenly Father. If there's one thing that ticked Jesus off, maybe more than anything else, as he walked the earth 2,000 years ago, was hypocrisy. Over and over and over again, and time and time and time again, he would come against the religious leaders of the, t- of the day, the Jewish religious leaders, and he would just say, listen, you talk a good talk, but you don't back it up. Your life doesn't show it. In fact, he told the crowds one time, he said, listen to what they say, but don't do as they do. They're hypocrites. They talk a good talk, but they don't do any of that. In fact, that story I just told you about the two uh, sons and the father, the farming father, I didn't make that up. That was Jesus. And that was actually a parable or a story. He spoke directly to the religious leaders saying, what do you think? Who obeyed? Who was true? Now it would make sense if Jesus was really, really strong against hypocrisy and he spoke about it a lot and he was a lot uh, big on obedience and and following what we know. It would make sense that James, Jesus' brother, 
The James who didn't think his brother was the son of God until he, he heard his brother predict uh, his own death and resurrection and pull it off. That James, it would make sense that when he wrote his letter, he would talk about some of the things Jesus talked about. And, and people have read the book of James and they say, it doesn't mention Jesus a whole lot. It's true. James only mentions the name Jesus twice. But out of any New Testament writer, he references, people have noticed this, he references Jesus' teaching directly more than any other New Testament writer. James does. He doesn't mention his name, but he mentions his brother's teaching more than any, more than Paul, more than John, more than Peter. He references directly Jesus' teaching, and he does so when it comes to living the practical life of obedience, not being a hypocrite. I'm sure he'd heard his brother talk about that from time to time. And so James does as well. Now, um, one of the things that, that you'll notice about hypocrisy is we all hate it, and yet we see it all around us. And I, it's, not a, it's not a religious problem. It's not a faith problem. It's a human problem. We are all hypocrites. We're all hypocrites. Uh, you know, we all say things that we're going to do things, and we don't do them. Let me just give you three examples, and this will sound condemning because it shows us that we're hypocrites, okay? So that's the point. If you feel bad, that was the point. Okay, so you're about to feel bad. We all say things that we don't do. Just look at marriages. Almost 50% of marriages, both inside the church and outside the church, end in divorce. What happened to for better or for worse? What happened to what we said we were going to do and we don't follow it up with our actions? And if you're married... How many marriages live, even though they survive, they live in disunity and neglect? What happened to love and cherish? Even if we stay married, we live hypocritically. Look at every parent, dads, I'm in this category. How we say to our kids, I love you. You're so valuable. You're so important. And then we spend all of our time working. And when we're home, we watch Netflix or we're on our devices and we've said we love you and our actions don't show it. What happened? What about our culture? You know, in our culture, we talk about how we're, so, oh, we're all about love and equality and inclusiveness and tolerance. And yet we are a more divided culture and growing more divisive as the days go. And we say one thing, but we don't live it. So why is that? Why is it that the very thing we hate, we keep doing? I think there's two really big reasons why we are all, we struggle with hypocrisy. Number one is we don't hate hypocrisy in here. We hate hypocrisy out there. And even the three examples I just gave, I bet in your mind you're kind of thinking, yeah, marriages, that's not mine. Oh, yeah. Parenting parents that do that. That's probably not me. Oh yeah, the culture. I'm, we, we separate ourselves because we hate hypocrisy out there, but we don't hate hypocrisy right here. And so we're not going to change until we hate it in here. The other reason I think, and maybe this is even a bigger reason why we haven't given up on hypocrisy, is because the alternative is hard. <laughs> really hard. The alternative to hypocrisy is really, really difficult. It's not hard to understand. In fact, it's only two words, and I'm not telling you the two words now because it's the point of the message, and then you'll just tune out the rest of the next 20 minutes. So you're going to have to pay attention a little bit longer. It's so simple. In fact, it's so simple we often disregard it, but it's really, really hard to live out. So we're going to find out. James actually tells us the two words, and he says it in a lot of words because he just doesn't want us to miss it. And so if you have your Bibles, go to James chapter 1, and we're starting verse 19. 19. And James would get, say, here's what Jesus was pushing against. My brother Jesus was pushing against when it came to hypocrisy, and here's what I'm going to push against as well. Here's what it looks like to live the Christian life. As you know, last week, we uh, started by looking at the idea that James kind of gives us that we need a new perception of things. That, you know, when we see as God sees, we're going to start living godly lives, or it leads us to the river of godliness, 
And we need a new perception on, on you know, trials we face. We need a new perception on wealth and poverty. A new perception on, 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 on who God is as good. A new perception on where temptation and sin come from. We need a new perception. And as we see through God's eyes, it leads us to the river of godliness. But as the old saying goes, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's right. And seen as God sees, James would say, and he ends chapter 1 by saying this, you will see, when you see as God sees, that's the start. It leads you to the river of godliness, but you cannot make someone drink. At some point, that needs to happen. And so we, we ended at verse 18 last week, which said, he chose, that's God chose, to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The idea is that God has found a way, he has made a way for us to be given new birth. Not birth in sin, but birth to eternal life. Birth in righteousness, birth in Jesus. And it's through the word of truth, which is James's way of saying the gospel. The gospel of my brother, Jesus. And as you put your faith in Jesus, we are given new birth. This is what the faith is. It's putting our trust in Jesus that his death and resurrection, his life of righteousness is now put on us. And James says, we have that new birth. So now because of that new birth, new birth should lead to new living. Therefore, he says, my dear brothers and sisters, rather, he says, take note of this. This is how it should play out. Just a practical way it could play out in your life as you've been given new birth in Jesus. Take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Now, it does not say to speak slowly. I'm going to keep speaking fast. It says, be slow to speak. So here's the interesting thing. As you look at that list, I think for most of us, we probably do the opposite of that, <laughs> right? Let's be honest. I mean, most of us are slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry, especially, I mean, I'm a guy, so I'm just going to put all guys in this category. You know, we hear half a sentence, we make our judgment, and we have our response, right? We're slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. And James says there's a new birth in Jesus, the word of truth. And as you live in that new birth, it should reverse. And we should. When he says everyone, he's writing to Christians, Messianic Jews. He says, we should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I bet if you do that, it will work out for you. In fact, just try that this week at home. Husbands, try that with your wife. Just be a little bit uh, quicker to listen and a little bit slower to speak and, and don't get angry. Okay, and, and fathers, try this with your kids. Try this with your employer, employers, with your employees. Just try that this week. See, I'm going to try what James asked people in Christ to do. And that is quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You know, the old proverb says this, that the one who has knowledge uses words with restraint. This is just wise. It will work out for you. And whoever has understanding is even tempered. If you have new birth, live in the new way. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Because, he says, because... Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You have been given new birth in Christ. And human anger doesn't bring about the new living that God desires. He's not talking about, there is a godly anger against injustice and sin and all things ungodly. A godly anger. He's talking about human anger. That, that fly off the handle, that uncontrolled, that, that emotionally charged anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, James says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Literally, as you live the new life in Christ, put off the old. Get rid of moral filth and evil. Put that off. And instead of saying put on, James says it interestingly. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which kind of caught me off guard because I feel like, okay, if something's planted in me, isn't it already predetermined that it's there? <laughs> James doesn't think so. He said there's things that can be planted in you that are not accepted or received. He sees that when, when the word comes to us, we have a choice to either humbly accept and receive or to reject the word planted in us. The receiving and rejecting of the word for James has to do with obedience. Obedience. 
like the two sons. They both received the word. It was planted in them. The command was given and they heard. But they didn't both receive it with humility. They didn't accept it. See, God plants his word in us and we have a choice. How will we receive it? And you know, James, he just follows his brother's teaching Jesus. Jesus had taught this. But when Jesus taught it, he taught it in a parable. And he'd once told, and you know, if you've been in church a long time, you know this story. Jesus taught about four kinds of soil. And he said, the, 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 the seed came. And he said, the seed represents the word of God. And he said, the, the, the seed that fell on, on, on a hard path is like a person who hears the word. The word's been planted. And it doesn't take root. It's hard. And then there's soil that that the seed is planted, the word of God is planted in a person whose soil is rocky. And there's a little bit of soil, but there's rock underneath, and it takes, but it doesn't last. And then he said, uh, there's a third soil, and it's the person who hears the word of God, and it grows up among thorns and thistles and weeds. And it grows up, but then because of the cares of the world and the worries of the world and the pursuit of wealth, it gets choked out. The word, uh, the, the, the seed doesn't grow. But there's a fourth soil, and the fourth soil is like word that is a seed and word that's planted in a person who is good soil. And it produces a crop 30, 60, 100 times what was planted. But the interesting thing, when Jesus told that parable, he says there's something different about the fourth person. In every person, he says, this is the person who hears the word, who hears the word, who hears the word. And the fourth time he says, who hears and accepts. And James says the same thing. We can all hear the word. But it it comes to obedience. Will you humbly accept the word planted in you? Let it change you. Let it change the core of who you are. It's there, but will you receive it? And James wants to make sure we don't miss it. So now he goes on this long, long kind of statements after statement saying, here's what it looks like. Here's what this one verse looks like. Get rid of moral filth. Allow God's word to be planted and accept it. And he says, this is what it looks like. Actually, this is what it doesn't look like. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is the alternative to hypocrisy. Two words, do it. If you do it, you're not a hypocrite. It's just how it works. And so James says the same thing. He says, listen, talk is cheap. Listening is useless. Knowledge is not helpful unless it somehow impacts your life and you do something about it. Compliance, Jesus said, with word of mouth isn't helpful. The two sons, he said, which one was, was obedient to his father? It doesn't matter what you say. In fact, good intentions don't get you anywhere. It's what you do. Do it. This is the Christian life. It's receiving the word and letting it uh, flow out from us. So he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And <laughs> do not merely listen. If you have a pen or a highlighter or a pencil, underline, star, circle, somehow draw attention to that word merely. James does not say, do not listen to the word. We are to be in the word. We are to be hearing good teaching. We are to be understanding more and more. But James is saying, if that's where it ends, you have deceived yourselves, which which is James's way of saying, you have a false sense of confidence that you're all good. A false sense of confidence that, oh yeah, I'm I'm all good. I know a lot. (laughs) I've read the whole Bible. I know a lot. I've been to Bible college. I know a lot. And James says, you have a false sense of confidence if it ends with listening. Watch out. Don't deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. We have the word planted in us. Let's do what it says. This is the alternative to hypocrisy. And it's hard. It's really hard. Now James gives an example of someone who does not do what it says, someone who merely listens. He says, anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says uh, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror 
and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like, which is his example of saying, that's ridiculous. And we're like, yeah, that would be ridiculous. But on a spiritual level, this happens so often in the church, doesn't it? We read the Bible and we say, man, the word spoke to me. Man, uh, there's some things in my life I got to change. Man, I heard that great message. Some things got to change. And it's like we walk away and don't do anything about it. It'd be like waking up in the morning and being like, well, there's some sleep in my eyes. There's some food crusties around the mouth. My hair's everywhere. Oh, well, and we forget. Do what it says. It's silly, James says. But then, in contrast, in contrast, James said, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, and he uses this word perfect law a lot, or royal law we're going to see next week, um, that gives freedom. His understanding of the law, Jewish people knew the law, 613 commandments. But when James uses the royal law or the law that gives freedom, he's referring not just to the Old Testament, and all of his hearers would have known that, but he refers to the Old Testament law as understood and interpreted and fulfilled in Jesus, his brother. And so he says it's a law that gives freedom. Jesus has shown us. He has fulfilled the law. And whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do that, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it looks like in our life practically. And then James, again, he goes, he's talked about speech already, a really practical, you know, here's what it looks like. Now he goes to another practical, and he says, those who consider themselves to be religious, which means to keep the law, and he goes back to speech, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Again, he says, religion, if you're actually a follower, it's got to show up in your life, in practical ways, like your speech. And then he says, and religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You know, the theme throughout the Old Testament, especially the prophets, but even in the law, there was this theme of the compassion and the heart of God for the down and outers for those who could not care for themselves. And in the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, they kept coming against the nation uh, for not obeying the law when it came to look after aliens, look after the fatherless, look after the widows. These were people in their culture at that time who couldn't get a job and make money on their own. They were dependent on the kindness of others. And so James, to first century Christians who, again, Widows and orphans were those who could not make a living on their own. He says, if you really want to have pure and faultless religion, it's got to show up in your life through love and through godliness, getting rid of that which pollutes your life. See, James understood the law as Jesus interpreted, and Jesus interpreted the law through one word, love. Love. It was one command. All the law and prophets could be summed up in one command. And it was a really, really uh, fast command. It went like this. Love God, love others. Just one command. Love God, love others. That was Jesus' command. That was his summation of the entire law. You know, for James, he would say the Christian life is a life that does. This is what it looks like. A Christian life is a life that does. When we engage with the gospel, it goes more than just a head. I understand who Jesus is. It goes more from understanding God wants me to love. It goes to a life that actually does. Because here's the truth about love. Love does. And if the Christian life is about love, then the Christian life is about does. It's about love. You know, James had said, seen through God's eyes leads to living godly lives. And now as he finishes off this section, he says it leads to a life of doing. Here's what it looks like to drink from the water of godliness as you see from God's perspective. It leads to a change of perception which leads to a change in living. It transforms us. Again, this was nothing new. What James has taught is nothing new because his brother Jesus had already taught this many times. In fact, James was referencing in this, a doer isn't just a hearer, but a doer. He references Jesus' most famous sermon 
the Sermon on the Mount. Read it later in, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But at the very end of chapter 7, when Jesus ends this Sermon on the Mount, which is very practical in nature, kind of like James, very practical in nature, Jesus tells this story, and uh, I'll, I'll actually read the story for you. He says this, after he's told them, here's what it looks like to be a follower of me. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, but doesn't stop there, puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. It wasn't whoever hears these words of mine and believes them cognitively, but puts them into practice. It doesn't, you, you, you're not building your house on the rock if you're just like, yeah, that's what I think. You're building your house on the rock when you say, that's how my life is lived out. That's what Jesus said. That's what James reiterates later. Those who put it into practice. But everyone, Jesus goes on, who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Jesus and James say the same thing. If you want to follow Jesus, it's going to show up in your life. The Christian life is a life that does. And here's the deal. If you're not a Christian and you're here this morning, right now you're thinking, amen. I just want to know some Christians who actually do it. Right? Because we know a lot of Christians that just, oh, this, we know what they believe, but we don't see what they actually believe by how they live so often. And so all the non-Christians in the room are saying, yeah, that's what I want to see. I want to see real, genuine faith, real life, real faith. That's what I want to see. How does this play out? What does it mean to follow Jesus? Not just what you believe, but how does it show up in one's life? So again, if, if, if we're against hypocrisy and even us Christians say, that's what I want to see from my fellow Christians, why don't we do it? I think one of the things, one of the reasons we as Christians don't all, always uh, live out the love of Christ and don't live out the godliness of Christ, I think one of the reasons is we hide behind knowledge. We hide behind knowledge. Knowledge seems so spiritual. Oh, I know all this apologetics. We just hide behind knowledge. Knowledge seems so, so spiritual. You know, I, I got all this great theology and it seems so spiritual. I've read the Bible, I know so much and it seems so spiritual and we kind of hide behind our knowledge. I'll just give you a pet peeve of mine. This is just personal. I have a pet peeve and it's when Christians say, I just don't like that Bible study. It's not deep enough. I need something deeper. And I always wonder, what is Deeper. What do we mean when we say, I just need something deeper? Uh, what is deeper? Jesus summed up the whole law with one word, love. What's deeper than that? What's deeper than love? You know, I think we get this idea of something deeper or more knowledge. I think we get it from a metaphor Paul uses when he talks to the, first Corinth, uh, the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And he says, listen, you're acting as infants. You need milk. You should be eating meat already, but you're not. And we get this idea that there's kind of like elementary truths and then there's deeper truths. And that's what he's referring to. But the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is not about knowledge. It's about how they were behaving. They were acting like little brats. They were, there was jealousy and envy. And they were, they were, they were acting like childish brats. And J Paul was frustrated. He said, you should be beyond this. You should be more godly than this. You should learn to love and understand the ways of God. <laughs> and later on in 1 Corinthians, same, same book of the Bible, the same people. Here's what... Paul says is most important. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, underline, highlight, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Here's the deal. Paul is saying, deeper knowledge and the gift of prophecy is not a bad thing to desire. But if you make it exclusive, you've missed it. Those are not the main meal. Those are, those are not the main meal of Christianity. Christianity is love. It's a, the Christian life is a life that does. 
But I think sometimes we can, we can hide behind knowledge. Here's a deep, deep small group study. Coming together every week and saying, how are you doing at loving God and loving people? And the next week you come together and you say, how are you doing at loving God and loving people? What about your wife? How are you doing at loving God? What about that church member that just drives you and say, how are you doing at loving God and loving people? That's deep. That's deep. And that's the Christian life. But here's the deal. I'm a pastor. I struggle with this. Because you know what I do for a living? Gain knowledge. I study the Bible. And it's so easy and so tempting for me to gain a lot of knowledge and miss the point, which is, it's got to play out in my life. I've said this often. You, you know, some of you will come and say, wow, that was a great message. I'm like, yeah, that was an easy one to preach. That's a hard one to live. That's a hard one to live. But that's where the rubber of the Christian life meets the road, where real life and real faith connect. You know, I don't think we have a knowledge problem in the church today, especially in North America, in Three Hills. I don't think Christians are like, I just don't know if I can live the Christian life. I don't have enough knowledge. I think if we put 50% of our knowledge to use, (laughs) hey, if we just lived out 10% of what we knew, we would be seen as saints. We have more knowledge than we know what to do with. We need to start living it out. See, most of us don't need more knowledge to say, treat your, love, uh, treat your spouse with some love. We don't need, uh, you know, some deeper kind of knowledge to know, stop lying. Start telling the truth. We don't need some deeper knowledge to know that we shouldn't slander or gossip. We already know this stuff. We don't need some deeper knowledge to know how to love our neighbor or love our coworker or love our employee or our employer or our church uh, brother or sister. We don't need deeper knowledge. We just need to Do it. We just need to do it. And James says the Christian life is a life that does. We need to stop as the church hiding behind knowledge. We need to start living it. Uh, Years ago, I played in a band uh, before I was a pastor. And uh, we would travel all over Alberta and Western Canada. And we played a lot of gigs. And something that happened when we were at shows, whether it was us or other bands, if the lead singer started to talk too much, Uh, the whole crowd would start to shout something. Now, I would never use these words. Okay, that was hypocritical. I have used these words, but they would yell out, shut up and play, (laughs) right? Because we didn't pay a lot of money to hear a band talk. We paid a lot of money to hear the band play. That's what you do. (laughs) And I wonder if the world looks at the church and sometimes they say, would you just shut up and play? Would you just stop with the talk And let it show up in your life. You know, sometimes I think we Christians are kind of like the guy who is jacked about working out. And he, he just starts researching all the things about working out and he, he reads books and he studies and he's, he listens to podcasts and he hears speakers, the, the, best pe- you know, the best people on health and working out that there is in the world and he's just gaining all this information which is all really good. But at the end of the day, if he doesn't hit the gym, it's pretty useless. You know, as Christians, sometimes we are tempted to listen to podcasts and hear the best pastor and go to four Bible studies a week, which isn't bad. But at some point, we got to put it into practice. As Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine and put them in practice, your life is built on a rock. But if you hear these words of mine, and there's a lot of hearing, but don't put them into practice, you've missed it. You've missed it. Your life is no stronger for it. And when the waves come and the storm comes, it will, it will crash as well. Now let me just, I know you're going to take me and emails. and I'm not saying knowledge is bad. I'm not saying stop going to Bible studies or stop learning. James doesn't say that either. He just says do not merely be listeners. Do not merely be hearers, but let it play out in your lives. So two things I want to encourage you to do this week from this message, because you're like, okay, great message, but again, what are we going to do about it? Two things. First of all, every day, I want you to ask yourself this question. How am I doing today at loving God and loving others? If the commandment is summed up in one word, love, 
How am I doing today with love? And secondly, I want you to read a little passage of scripture every day this week. Maybe it's five verses, maybe it's a whole chapter, but I want you to read every day this week because James says we should be hearers. So we need to get into the word. We need to hear what God's word says to us. But at the end of each time you read, I want you to ask yourself this question. Now, how does this play out in my life? What do I need to do? How do I need to think differently so that my life starts to look differently? And if you don't know where to start because you're not reading right now, start in James or 1 Peter or 1 John or... Those are three that are really good starts, I'd say. So start there and uh, see how God's uh, spirit starts to ignite in your life, not just with hearing, but how does this play out in your life? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, James doesn't really just beat around the bush ever. And this one's challenging. Father, I pray that we would be challenged in the way of encouraged rather than just discouraged. To be challenged so that we are encouraged to put into practice what we have heard. That we would be those who who don't just speak or hear or listen, but that our lives would speak louder than our words because we already know they do. Father, thank you that you have given us new life through Jesus. And it is that new life that produces new living. May we accept the new life and may we accept the new living you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.